Today we're going to talk about the importance of value. Um, to get a believable painting, you really need to have a, a good understanding of value. And one way that you can get a better understanding is to actually chart it out. So um, controlling the light, this is from Robert Wade, a quote from him, controlling the light enables you to be in command of the situation. So even though watercolor is kind of got a mind of its own and we don't really have control of every part of it, um, that's the beauty of it, by the way, is is the loss of control where it just is free to do its own thing. But you can control the light. And that is where we can change the mood of the scene. That's where we can um, make it a bright sunny day or a overcast kind of rainy day. It changes the scene, the mood of the scene, as well as um, knowing the colors to use in um, painting your scene. Said that a lot, didn't I? Scene, 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 scene. I seen it. Um, anyway, so Robert Wade, by the way, is a very amazing artist that he just passed away, but I've got a few of his books, and the one that I'm just kind of thumbing through and reading through is this uh, painting more than the eye can see. And he goes into how to change the mood. I mean, you can see right here, this picture is uh, sunny and bright and that's his reference photo. He changed it, just the mood of it, just by changing the colors and the um, lighting, the contrast. So I am gonna be referring to his book throughout this little study, but first let's start with our chart. I've got um, I've got some Payne's Gray here. You can use any black or neutral tint even to get your black and white value scale. And then I'm gonna use Hooker's Green for my color one because color has value too. And I think sometimes we, don't think about it as much as black and white, but we want to we want to kind of compare um, the value scale black and white with color. And you can chart all your colors out if you really wanted to. If you have nothing to do on a rainy day, or you just want to get a better handle on knowing the value of things. So first of all, I have ten squarish doesn't have to be perfect, um, 10 squares drawn out. And I numbered them up here, one through 10. One's gonna be the lightest, 10's gonna be the very darkest. So this is also a good exercise for paint to water ratio. And I can leave a link to that in my description below. And you can go back and look at the paint to water ratio and all the things that we call those different levels of paint to water ratio. I said that a lot too, didn't I? Okay, so um, this isn't as easy as as you might think it would be. We're just gonna paint little squares with color and you know, but the trick is getting it to step up very gradually until we get to the darkest dark. So I'm gonna start out with what we would call a T and T is going to be barely tinting the paper. So I'm going to get just a mix of that. You're not going to need very much. This is not a very big space. I've got a Princeton brush here, um, number four round, 4050. So I'm just going to start top. Top scale is going to be my black and white scale. So I'm just using a scrap piece of arches 140 and barely tinting that. So I'm gonna be tipping this around a little bit to, all right, you can see that I've got barely a tint. So to gradually go up, you just wanna add a little bit more paint into your water mixture there and we're just going to step it up 
I'm gonna try to leave a little line in between so it doesn't bleed into each other, but if it does, it's not a big deal. This is an exercise, this is a practice, and you can dab off a little. If you feel like it's too dark, that might be a little bit too dark for my next step. I'm just gonna soak some of it up, lift some of it out, and move on to my next square. So the greatest influence on shape is form. It's another thing that I'm reading in his book. And if you can imagine a completely black room full of furniture, say, if there is no light, you're not gonna see the furniture. It's gonna be completely ink black. So the more light you turn on, say you turn on a little night light, you're gonna see a dimly lit room full of furniture. And the more light you turn on, the more of that form you're gonna see because that light is revealing the furniture. So if you think about this, um, on a beautiful, bright, sunny day, you've got really intense light, the sun is shining, and you can see really white, white, or light, light highlights. And that is gonna be the very lightest of your scale. And then the shadows are gonna be the very darkest, and they can go all the way up to a 10 in certain spots. Um, usually the shadowed side of the barn, or I'm using a barn as an example, the light side is gonna be the lightest value. The shadowed side is usually gonna fall into the 40 to 50 range. So that's something that is helpful when you're painting a scene like that to um, give it a realistic appearance. I'm just adding a touch of water and spreading that around. I don't wanna to get too dark before I get up in here. Um, but if you have a good value range in your painting, it's going to be more realistic. And as I think about that too, any of the other shadows that you have in your picture should fall into that range. So you don't want to have two buildings side by side. The shadowed side of one of the buildings is nice in that five or four range. And then the other building, you kind of forgot about that principle maybe, and you did it in a lighter value. It's not gonna read um, very well. So you wanna make sure that you're consistent with your shadows. And I'm losing a little bit of water, so I just dipped in. I'm gonna paint quickly here to get finished with this and start on my green. And this is going to also dry lighter. So what you see here initially is darker than it's gonna be when it's fully dry. So I've got a pretty good range so far. I'm gonna add more water to my puddle and see if I can't step it just slightly up from that. More water just to get the flow so I can get that space filled up pretty quickly. Okay, so let's see how that's not quite dark enough. A little bit more, just going to get it as close to that line as I can. It's important to have a brush that holds a lot of paint and water because as you paint, as your brush touches the paper, um, you want it to release as well. Some brushes I've used have just held on. It's like you're just trying, you're struggling to get the paint and water to release out of that brush. But so it's important to have good brushes. It doesn't always mean that they're super expensive. Um, I feel like these Princeton's are pretty uh, 
good price range and a good brush. So you can get those online. Should link, uh, I'll leave a link in the video to Amazon or Blick. You can get them either place. A little bit more to finish out this square. It's stepped up just a little bit. So the next couple of squares, I even feel like I could add a little bit more color to that. And it was still wet, so I could add that and it just spread out without blossoming. The next two squares are gonna be getting thicker and thicker. So we've, we've went from a T consistency kind of through here, gradually going into more of a coffee, gradually going into a milk, and then we're coming up into a cream. So a creamier consistency, like maybe half and half might have that consistency. And then that final square is gonna be butter, more of that buttery melted butter consistency, more inky, inky. You wanna see less of the paper. So most of these, you can see the paper shining through. This is transparent watercolor. So that's what happens, unless it's a more opaque paint and then you get uh, more coverage. You don't get as much of the paper coming through. So I think, I think we've got, these two are pretty close. I'm not sure if they're different enough, but again, this is an exercise. So now I'm gonna make sure that I have my brush pretty fairly wet. And I'm getting a, just a real thick mix of that. I want it to spread. So if I don't have enough water on my brush, it's gonna be a dry, you know, more of a dry brush stroke, and I don't want that because I want this to be where you really can't see the paper through it. So using the body of my brush more to bring that paint down and cover more area. Just going to have enough paint. Very inky black at the end. Okay, so we've got a pretty good scale there. Uh, so the intensity of the light source controls the contrast range. Uh, the stronger the light, the greater the contrast. Again, this is from Robert Wade's book. Um, the greater the uh, or the weaker the light, the more restricted the contrast. So in a high contrast or high light source, you've got stronger light. So you've got a light, light, and a dark, dark. But if you have a low light situation, a weaker lighting situation, that range is going to shrink. So you might only have uh, this as your lightest light instead of this. So it's really fun to... Um, put that into practice in your work and try to do some different studies. Um, taping off a paper, like a um, even a quarter sheet, and then dividing it into quarters and doing the same scene with different contrast ranges, that'll really give you a good idea of how you can change the mood of your painting by the lighting. And so this is, uh, th this is something that's so simple that they should be stressed over and over. They're um, really, what he says in his book is their key thoughts, the keys to unlock the doors to further revolutions and the solution to so many of our paintings. So often we see paintings that um, would be so much better if the lighting had been uh, better, if the contrast had been correct. So it's really important to get a hold of the 
idea of this. And this is one way to do it. And also practice your painting in your brush strokes and your paint water ratio. So I feel like I've got a great range here. These two, again, like I said, I feel like these are the hardest um, ones to get stepped up in the, you know, gradual way. So we're going to move on to the green clean now. water and clean brush. Probably a little that left in it, but let's move on to our hooker's green. Uh, both of these, let's see, the Payne's Gray was a Holbein. That's what that dark was. Hooker's, <coughs> excuse me, Hooker's Green is a Daniel Smith color, but you don't have to stick to those brands. Use what you have. And that's a little started too thick there. So let's just dilute that a little bit and get it to a much, much lighter, which means adding more water, less paint. And I'm just gonna take what I have on my brush with that extra water and barely tint my paper. Now, you've got different colors, obviously, and not all colors can be brought to this kind of a dark. So the green will be able to do that, but if you get a yellow, for instance, or a maybe even a red, you're not gonna get that same deep dark. But it's important to know what you can do. So that's why I think it's good to do a color value chart as well. So little by little, we're just stepping up that value and A little more paint. Maybe you gotta be careful not to step it up too quickly because then you get up here and it's really close like I talked about. That's just a little bit darker. So when you hear people talk about uh, mid-value, they would be referring to this middle square. So that would be a mid-value. And that's important to know. A little bit more. All right, a little bit more paint in there. Step it up a little bit further. Maybe even more. All right, a little bit more water into that puddle, but I'm adding more paint too than I had in that square. So this takes practice, by the way. I wanna reiterate that because I've been doing this for many, many years. So I kind of have a feeling of my paint to water ratio without really analyzing it too much. It's just a feeling and I know 
that I need to add more or I need to lift or whatever it might be, add more water, add more paint, just becomes instinct the more you do it. So that's why you need to keep doing it. Instinct for this does not happen overnight. I just dipped in a little too much water, so I'm gonna add a little bit more paint. I have three squares to go, so I've got to make sure there's enough of a change. These are tiny washes, by the way. Every brush stroke is a wash. Even if it's just one little line, it's still a wash. So I'm gonna spread that out a little bit. Hopefully that gets darker. I think I need just a little bit more green in there. Get it darker. And then these next two, this one needs to be, this one needs to be close to the inky, creamy, but or buttery consistency. This one needs to be just a step up from that. This is where it gets to be a little bit more challenging. to keep it a gradual gradation. We see, uh, we'll see how, how well I did on this when it's completely dry. Not before, but when it's completely dry. Okay, so I'm loading my brush up with water there just to get more flow. Also, when you're uh, working on a painting, the highlight areas should be observed first when looking at a subject with a view to per producing a painting. So you wanna figure out where you're highlights are gonna be. And one way to do that is to squint. And if you squint at the scene, it it really helps to zero in on those dark, or I mean those highlights. And then you need to remember that the white of the paper is the lightest light. And reserve somehow those lights. Painting around it, using masking fluid, uh, using tape even, um, some sort of resist. I don't use resist too much. I'll do masking fluid and sometimes I'll do tape. Um, just depends on the painting. All right. I should always have my water on the opposite side. Rinse that off. This is not completely dry, obviously. There's still a sheen over here, but we've got a pretty good idea of um, the gradation, the value range. This one's a little bit better. This, These guys are pretty darn close, and these are barely a step away from each other, but you get the idea. Also, I went and dug out my little color wheel because I remember that there was a value chart on here too, but they call it a grayscale. Um, their value one is the darkest, and I don't know why, but that just seems backwards to me. I think the smallest number should be the lightest value, um, but either way, it doesn't matter. You've got a value scale here that you can use um, without having to paint your own if you don't really want to, but it's good practice. Um, but you can find these charts uh, probably on Amazon and just use it for, you know, learning. It's a really good tool for learning. So hope this helped you guys to um, kind of get a better understanding of what you can do 
when you utilize contrast in your painting, it can make a big difference in the impact that it has and the emotional uh, feeling that you get from looking at it. So go try it yourself, pick out your favorite colors, pick out a favorite brush and just get to painting. We'll see you in the next video. Happy painting. Bye-bye.